Welcome to History at the OK Corral. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, leave us a comment down below, and share this episode with a fellow history lover. And now, on to tonight's episode. July 3rd, 1754. George Washington signs off on the surrender of Fort Necessity after a relentless assault by a contingent of French and native forces. The official tally for the British would be 31 killed, 70 wounded, and 369 captured, including Colonel George Washington himself. The Franco-Indian force only lost three men, with 19 wounded. The numbers do little to paint the true picture of despair the colonial militiamen found themselves in that day, with their killed and wounded littering the drenched sod of the Great Meadows, after a torrential downpour that afternoon rendered even their weapons impotent. Perhaps even Washington himself would have found it hard to believe that in just one year's time, he would be back in the Ohio country just 50 miles north, facing levels of atrocities that would outshine the defeat at Fort Necessity tenfold. On July 4th, Washington headed out from Fort Necessity with his men, having agreed to not return for a period of one year under the conditions of his surrender and release. Two colonial officers were to be held captive by the French for this period to ensure the terms were observed. Washington prioritized getting the wounded to medical care as quickly as possible, hoping to save as many men as they could, with many requiring amputations from the onset of infections in their wounds. Along the way, the natives continued to loot and raid the militiamen, but Washington ordered them to stand down, not wanting to suffer another violent confrontation that would almost certainly end in the other side's favor. During the Battle of Fort Necessity, the Congress of Albany was underway, taking place from mid-June through mid-July 1754. The Congress saw representatives of seven British colonies convene to discuss how to improve relations with native tribes and defend themselves against the encroachment of New France in their territorial interests. At the Congress, Benjamin Franklin attempted to get the colonies to agree to a plan of union, forming together under a president appointed by the British Crown. The popular join-or-die political cartoon was born from Franklin's idea. While this plan was voted down by the representatives, it would become the basis of the Articles of Confederation and the U.S. Constitution adopted two decades later, the foundation of the independent United States government. After the disappointing defeat at Fort Necessity, Washington resigned his post when the Virginia Regiment was divided into ten independent companies. This realignment would have brought with it a demotion from the rank of colonel. Washington knew the early retirement would be temporary, writing that his stepping aside was, quote, not to gratify any desire I had to leave the military. My inclinations are strongly bent to arms. After the death of his father, Lawrence Washington, a series of events would lead to his coming into power as the Lord of Mount Vernon. Lawrence's widow Anne remarried and moved to Westmoreland County, and then on December 10, 1754, her daughter Sarah passed away. George, who was not a wealthy man by his own means whatsoever at the time, would lease the estate from Anne, as well as its 18 slaves, under the condition that each Christmas, George would ship 15,000 pounds of tobacco to Anne as payment. This agreement would bring George Washington considerable stress, but would also in time make him one of the wealthiest men in the Virginia Commonwealth. Major General Edward Braddock was sent to the British colonies to lead an aggressive multi-pronged campaign to rebuke New France from their territory. Braddock arrived in Hampton, Virginia on February 20, 1755, with two regiments of British regular troops. His comprehensive strategy included Admiral Edward Boscoen sailing a fleet to the Gulf of St. Lawrence to prevent French reinforcements from reaching Canada. Braddock's two regiments were sent to Wills Creek to embark on an expedition to Fort Duquesne. The 50th and 51st regiments had been dormant since King George's War and were to head out from Albany to the French Fort of Niagara under the command of William Shirley. After Braddock took Fort Duquesne, he would continue up the Allegheny River, one by one taking every French fort along the way until uniting with Shirley in Niagara that fall. Major General Braddock requested that George Washington join his staff. While he had reservations about the young colonel's conduct at Fort Necessity, Braddock learned that Washington possessed an intimate knowledge of the landscape of the Ohio country that would prove invaluable. Washington responded that he wished to be given a royal officer's commission, elevating him above the status he held as colonel in the Virginia militia. When that was denied, Washington offered to serve as aide-de-camp in a volunteer capacity. This position would prevent him from being ordered around by the British officers and have him directly reporting to Braddock. In hindsight, had Washington been given the royal officer commission he so vigorously sought, there is a distinct possibility he would not have altered that allegiance to become the commander-in-chief in 1775 of the United States Army. Washington wrote that an ambitious man 
must hide his desires, and though he desired not only the royal officer's status, but also to run for the house of Burgess, ultimately he inquired to his younger brother Jack to gather information on how it would be received were George to run. Finding his support was not at the time sufficient, he opted not to run, thus showing his penchant for political cunning and a willingness to undertake clandestine action when it benefited him. After appointing Jack Washington to take over as Lord of Mount Vernon in his absence, George would join Braddock in May of 1755 in Frederick, Maryland. Colonel Washington disputed Major General Braddock's plan for an assault through traditional means, informing him of the fighting style of the natives. Their desire was to inflict damage on a larger force and flee before suffering casualties, stressing an asymmetrical approach to warfare. Braddock maintained an air of superiority towards every colonial he interacted with, even at his own peril. Upon these four warnings of the natives' penchant for hostile ambush, he demurred. These savages may be a formidable enemy to your raw American militia, but upon the king's regular and disciplined troops, it is impossible that they would make any impression. In early June, Braddock and his force of 3,000 men headed out for the forks of the Ohio. With dozens of cattle in tow, as well as 50 women who had agreed to assist the procession, the pace of their advance was at times two miles a day. Braddock had rebuked Washington's suggestion to travel lightly through the Appalachian Range they were to traverse. Taking only pack horses and bare essentials, Braddock, however, opted for an overloaded caravan of carriages and cannons. Braddock, who was unfamiliar with the physical geography, also struggled to make headway, as much of the trails and roads they needed to use had to be widened and worked on as they advanced. Washington would call for them to split into two columns, one with the majority of the fighting men to charge ahead, and the other column to construct the pathway, bringing it up with the women, cattle, and wagons. Braddock would agree on the adoption of this strategy and lead the column charge forth at a great pace, the general so emboldened by the lack of resistance they faced along the way that he would end up several miles ahead of the supply column. Washington was afflicted with dysentery that gave him fits of diarrhea and vomiting that severely depleted his energy. He also suffered from an agonizing case of hemorrhoids that caused him to have to travel lying flat in the back of a wagon much of the time, unable to sit upon a saddle. Braddock gave Washington a bottle of Dr. James's medical powder, a combination of phosphate of lime and antimony, to treat his hemorrhoids. Washington would call it the finest medicine in the world. Just after crossing the Monongahela en route to Fort Duquesne, the progress would come to an abrupt halt. On the morning of July 9th, a majority native coalition force led by French Captain Daniel Lenard de Beaujou arrived too late to the river to ambush the British and colonial forces. The French captain's forces number roughly 800 men under his command, about half the number of men stationed to defend Fort Duquesne, composed of officers, regulars, as well as Canadian militia alongside 600 native warriors. Among the tribes present are the Ottawa, the Mississauga, the Delaware, the Shawnee, the Wyandotte, and the Potawatomi. The native forces hid amongst the trees on either side of the road towards Fort Duquesne, with the majority of the French Canadians stationed further up the road along the path to the fort. Around one o'clock that afternoon, the advance guard of the British, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Gage, spotted the enemy lying in wait in the trees just after crossing the river, and ordered his men to fire upon them. The opening volley of the battle did little damage to the Franco-native forces as a whole, but as luck would have it, Captain Bougeau was caught in the line of fire and killed in the opening salvo of the Battle of Monongahela, which would also be referred to, for good reason, as the Battle of the Wilderness. The native forces, as they had done at Fort Necessity, took cover amongst the trees, stones, and brush, raining down an ongoing fire upon the redcoats. The British repeatedly attempted to form themselves into columns, as was their training, and in doing so, merely simplified the task of the natives. As the advance guard was repelled, suffering heavy casualties, Gage's men began to retreat. While this was occurring, Braddock ordered the troops from the main body to charge forward, causing a chaotic sequence when they collided with one another in a folly of errors. This allowed the natives to wreak further havoc as they fired on this tangled mass of humanity, disorganized, disheveled, and suffering ever greater losses. As officers of the advance guard attempt to organize their men, waving swords that glittered in the sun overhead, they became the easiest targets of all. Gage's force suffered 18 officers killed in these early exchanges. This perpetuated a further breakdown of British command and discipline. Braddock attempted to reclaim order by calling for his men to reorganize in advance, but the mounting losses and unrelenting native fire presented any ensemble larger than a platoon from forming. The disoriented herd of British soldiers were corralled together in an area stretching less than 250 yards in length 
and under 100 feet across. Even when the British soldiers could gather themselves enough to return fire, they had few targets of which to take aim. Their best chances to fire came when a native was sprinting from one tree to another to reposition himself with even deadlier effectiveness, and even then, they would only catch a mere glimpse of them. When the redcoats formed themselves into lines as they had been trained, multiple incidents of friendly fire occurred. The rear guard, tasked with defending the siege cannons brought to overcome Fort Duquesne, were left on their own. Civilian teamsters unhitched their horses from their wagons and rode away in fear. The women who had been driving the cattle, just over 50 in total, were nearly all lost, with over half being killed outright. Braddock maintained the most steadfast level of composure throughout this day, riding valiantly even as four horses had been shot out from underneath him. It was only when a musket ball was shot through Braddock's back, knocking him off his horse, that a complete collapse in order occurred. This came after withstanding ceaseless fire for over three hours. Washington, who had ridden up from the rear with Braddock, had by all accounts performed courageously having had two horses shot out from under him that day, and even requiring the help of his men to place him back in the saddle as he was so stricken from exhaustion due to his illness. By the end of the day, Washington had four bullet holes torn through his cap and uniform, but as per usual, he was improbably unharmed. The final tally of British and colonial losses from their 1,300 strong was 457 killed, 450 wounded, and a few dozen taken prisoner. James Smith, a member of this colonial British force who was captured that day, would recall several soldiers being tortured and burned alive in the night following the battle. As they retreated from the battlefield, Washington received his final order from the dying Braddock to deliver a message to Colonel Dunbar, his division lying 40 miles to the rear, to send forth wagons, medicine, and provision for the helpless legions of defeated and dying that lay in the wake of the day's affair. Washington, exhausted and ill, gathered the fortitude to ride all through the night to deliver the message. During the retreat back from the Monongahela, Braddock succumbed to his wounds, and Washington had him buried on the road passing through the Great Meadows near Fort Necessity. After his burial, Washington had the wagons and men traverse over the top of his freshly dug grave, packing the earth back together tightly to prevent it from being discovered by natives and saving his body from desecration. Colonel Dunbar led the defeated force back to the east. He ordered 150 wagons to be burned and the cannons destroyed, preventing these supplies and armaments from falling into enemy hands. The dejected survivors then carried on towards Philadelphia. Captain Bougeau was buried on July 12th at Fort Duquesne, the victor in a battle that saw both commanders lose their lives. The defeat was far more shocking to the British than Fort Necessity, as the small, undersized militia force inside the crudely built fortification had not been expected to stave off such an act of French aggression on their own. Braddock's multi-front strategy, designed to evoke the power of the British Empire and her colonies to drive out New France, was for all intents and purposes buried with Major General Braddock on the road passing Great Meadows. New France now had a strong foothold within the Ohio country. Braddock left his battle sash and two pistols to George Washington, and it was recorded that Braddock's last spoken words were, Who would have thought? We shall know better another time. It would take three long years for the British to return to Fort Duquesne and attempt to turn the tide of war that was now undeniably underway. But for tonight, those are other stories for other times. Thank you for joining us on this episode of History at the OK Corral. Be sure to click the like button, share this episode with a friend, and become a subscriber. And also, if you'd like to support our work and gain early access to episodes, as well as ad-free viewing, you can become a member of this channel by clicking on the Join button or click the link in the description below to become a member on Patreon. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, home of history's greatest shootouts and showdowns.